Uh, I begin in the name of Allah, most gracious, ever merciful. This is the traditional uh, introductory uh, verse that uh, many Muslims recite when they begin a speech of this, of this sort. Um, I'm truly delighted to be here. And I would like to first off thank all of the organizers, particularly the Ahmadiyya Muslim Student Association, for putting on this tremendous event, very timely, very apt, very appropriate for our current climate. I also wanted to thank uh, all of the students who've taken out time from your evening to be here on a Thursday night, which isn't easy. Um, it is a tremendous honor, both as a, a professor of law and also a litigation counsel here in Los Angeles to be hosting in these days a true luminary of the law from Pakistan, um, and that is uh, Mr. Mujibur Rahman. Um, in a few minutes, I'll be giving his lengthier formal introduction before he takes uh, um, the, the microphone and delivers his keynote address. But I wanted to set some context for his remarks uh, just so I can frame some of these issues and perhaps um, it could cement some of these concepts as you hear Mr. Rahman speak. ISIS, as it's referred to, and there are other names as well, ISIL or IS, is a shorthand name for the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And of course, everyone in this room knows that it has made headlines. And that is because it has initiated what can be described as a dramatic military conquest of Iraqi territory, which spans Syria and Iraq, but predominantly Iraq. And the headline-grabbing activities that ISIS has engaged in includes the ruthless treatment of Iraqi religious minorities, which include Christians and Yazidis, who have as their basis Zoroastrian teachings and elements. And over 100,000 such minorities live at risk because of this dramatic uptake, uptick in violence by this group, ISIS. And of course, more dramatically and more closer to home for us, we know that this group has launched a string of videotaped beheadings of Western hostages, including two United States American journalists covering the civil war in Syria. And the situation in Iraq and Syria is, suffice it to say, quite complex. And it presents a continuing humanitarian and human rights crisis with millions of people, millions, fleeing for their lives and hundreds of thousands of people at risk of being killed. It presents a threat to Middle East stability, a geopolitical threat, with ISIS, this group, promising to create an Islamic caliphate in this region, which would erase modern borders and impose its own version of an extremist, a militant manifestation or a fundamentalist perversion of Islam at its core teachings. And as it stands now, ISIS presents, I think it could be fair to say, an unknown threat to the larger world, including us here in America, with the militant group beheading international hostages and recruiting, you can say jihadists or extremists who purport jihad or a holy war as they understand that term to be, across the globe. So ISIS, in short, is an existential threat of a magnitude that most of us, if not all of us, can't quite yet comprehend. Now, as it is true of terrorist groups, particularly Al-Qaeda, we know that the international community and the United States leading that effort engages in counteroffensives to combat this scourge. President Obama, in early September, addressed the nation about this threat. And he said something 
that's quite profound, and I quote the entire passage as follows. Now let's make two things clear. ISIS, or ISIL as he referred to it, is not Islamic. No religion condones the killing of innocents, and the vast majority of ISIL's victims have been Muslim. And second, ISIL is certainly not a state. It was formerly Al-Qaeda's affiliate in Iraq and has taken advantage of sectarian strife and Syria's civil war to gain territory on both sides of the Iraq-Syrian border. It is recognized by no government nor the people it subjugates. ISIL is a terrorist organization, pure and simple, and it has no vision other than the slaughter of all who stand in its way, end quote. So this is a statement from the President of the United States. Now it stands for us as students and for us as Americans and with the intellectual curiosity that should consume you to question whether the President of the United States is accurate in his description. Now many millions of people will argue that he is in so far as ISIL doesn't represent Islam and is not a state. But that statement is a debatable point. It is a point that should be put under a microscope and examined and scrutinized. And part of the talk today and the questions and answers that follow are about whether or not that statement is true. The fundamental question are members of ISIS Muslim or not is an interesting question. The question as whether the source of inspiration for what ISIS stands for is the Quran, is scripture, is pure Islam or not is a question to ask. And if it indeed is an aberration, what is the role of Muslims to combat it? let alone the Western world or the non-Muslim world. That is, if ISIS is a tumor in the body of Islam, a tumor, how do Muslims then combat that tumor? These and other questions should be on your mind. They are fair questions. They are honest questions. They are reasonable questions. And it is for us to have an intellectually robust and rich debate about these questions. David Brooks, who writes for the New York Times, is a, a famed columnist. And he wrote a very interesting piece after the beheadings of the American journalists, particularly Mr. Foley. And he said something in the, in the end of his op-ed that caught my eye. He said in his summary of what ISIS is, and I quote, ISIS is a spiritual movement that will have to be surmounted by a superior version of Islam. What a profound statement. He's speaking about the spiritual foundation for this group, not the political foundation, the spiritual foundation. And he argues that ISIS is a spiritual organization. And his admonition, if you will, his prescription, if you will, is that ISIS should be replaced with a superior version of Islam. Well, that too creates several questions in our minds. How do we replace an ideology that's calling for the outright killing of innocent minorities, innocent civilians? How do Muslims rise up and tackle this problem if indeed it requires a superior version of Islam to surface. The struggle for the soul of Islam. That is the question, the vexing question on the minds of so many of us and so many Muslims. Who speaks for Islam? Who claims the mantle of Islam? What is ISIS? Is it Islamic or not? Well, these and other questions are what draws us to bring to this campus, University of California, Irvine, our keynote speaker, Mr. Mujibur Rahman. 
Mr. Mujibur Rahman is among Pakistan's most renowned lawyers. He is a noted Islamic scholar and author. He is currently a senior advocate of the Pakistan Supreme Court, the highest court in Pakistan. And he has argued hundreds of cases in his extraordinary 53-year career. He founded his own law firm right out of law school in Rawalpindi, a main metropolis city in Pakistan. He graduated from the University of Punjab in 1957. He obtained his law degree from the University of Karachi in 1961. And for those 53 years, he has argued many cases before the highest court, the Supreme Court of Pakistan. He's devoted the lion's share of his legal career to the cause of religious freedom. And some who know him, those who admire his work, those who admire his courage, have often referred to him as the Thurgood Marshal of Pakistan. For those who are familiar with the legendary Justice Thurgood Marshall, his career, of course, as a Supreme Court Justice, most people know, but it is his pursuit of fighting the most important civil rights cases of our era that gained him notoriety for this fundamental principle of tackling this notion of, of a separate but equal segregated society for African Americans. It is the same type of pursuit that drives Mr. Rahman. He has defended hundreds of cases specifically against Ahmadi Muslims. Now, Ahmadis are a group of Muslims in the minority in Pakistan, several million by many counts and research estimates, that have been declared to be non-Muslim by the Constitution of Pakistan. The Second Amendment to Pakistan's Constitution has declared the entire community exactly 40 years ago to be non-Muslim. And since 1984, when Pakistan passed the infamous blasphemy laws that criminalize insults to Islam, Ahmadis can be arrested for posing as Muslims. The mere existence of an Ahmadi is a criminal offense in Pakistan. So as a result of this Kafka-esque legal landscape that exists in Pakistan, Ahmadis have suffered tremendously. And Mr. Rahman has been at the forefront of the fight for their rights. He has argued many cases where Ahmadis were charged with blasphemy, cases where Ahmadis were languishing in prison, facing capital punishment for their quote unquote crimes. And two cases that I would like to note stand out. The first is the landmark case called Mujibur Rahman versus the government of Pakistan. These laws that I refer to, these blasphemy laws, were challenged, not on whether or not they were constitutional, but whether or not they were even Islamic. There was a Sharia court in Pakistan, and Mr. Rahman challenged those laws before that highest religious body. And he argued that these laws are un-Islamic. It was interesting that Mr. Rahman, as an Ahmadi, is declared to be non-Muslim by law, and he could not appear as a matter of law in the religious court, because that's only for Muslims. So he actually became the lead petitioner. And it was his name on the caption so that he could argue the very case that he was defending as the petitioner. That case ultimately was decided against the Ahmadis and ultimately those laws were upheld as being consistent with Islam. But the fight didn't stop for Mr. Rahman there. Several years later, he challenged the very same laws before the highest court in Pakistan in a case very famous in Pakistan jurisprudence, Zahiruddin versus State, a case that was decided in 93, eight appeals brought by Ahmadis. They were all arrested for saying the Islamic slogan, the kalima, the principal creed of Islam. And Mr. Rahman was served as co-counsel on that case. And he argued now these laws are before, are being subject to scrutiny under the constitution of Pakistan. And they're inconsistent with the freedom of religion clause of Article 20 of Pakistan's constitution. Well, the court came back and said, no, they are constitutional. And the decision was based on a remarkable situation where the Supreme Court of Pakistan relied exclusively on the United States Supreme Court and cited to eight to 10 cases of the US Supreme Court to say that just like Coca-Cola, 
has a right to its patented formula. Pakistan has a right to its Islamic epithets, Islamic terminology, mosques, assalamu alaikum, basic phrases. And Ahmadis were perpetually violating those trademarks. By being who they are, they were perpetually blaspheming. And these, own, this, these company and trademarks law protect their rights. And they cited to US case laws, in, in many cases, completely erroneously citing to those cases, and ultimately said that Ahmadis should be subject to this restriction because they offend the Sunni Muslim majority. And again, those cases were upheld. 20 years later, it still remains that Ahmadis are declared to be non-Muslim by constitutional amendment, and those blasphemy, law, blasphemy laws have suffocated the rights of Christians, Hindus, and Ahmadis, and Shias, and other Sunni Muslims. Several, almost 2,000 cases have been registered, and 40% of all arrests on, of those laws are of Ahmadis. So Mr. Rahman, since that time, has continued his fight. And he's inspired a generation of American-trained Ahmadi lawyers and other Muslim lawyers. And we're delighted to have invited him six weeks ago to the United States. And he's been addressing various universities on various aspects of these laws at Harvard Law School, at Princeton University, at Columbia Law School and NYU Law School last week. And now we're delighted to have him here at the University of California, Irvine. He'll soon be going to Stanford after this lecture. But tonight, he speaks on ISIS. Because Mr. Rahman is an Islamic scholar and has a philosophical analysis of the basis for this terrorist, terrorist activities, we are delighted that even though his human rights advocacy is what sets him apart in his legal career, it is his expertise in all areas of law, including Islamic law and Sharia law, that bring him to this camp campus to speak on a topic that is so important to all of us. So without further ado, I turn the mic over to Mr. Rahman. Thank you, Amjad. It gives me a great pleasure, and I'm Truly honored to be here in this campus this evening. And it gives me pleasure to see so many young people who have interest in the subject that I'm going to talk, talk about. People of my generation somehow, sometime labor under an impression that the younger generation really does not take interest in the issues that are so vital. I'm going back to Pakistan to tell my people that young people in America do take interest in the vital issues that troubles the whole world. So it's a great pleasure being here. Thank you all for having me here. Amjad has given a very elaborate and very generous introduction. I do not know whether I deserve all that. But it is very humbling for me to compare a person like me with Thurgood Marshall, who was a great man. I am not that great. I am a very humble man. All that I have to my credit, if at all, is a fight which I have waged 53 years of my life. I am 80 now, and if I live long enough, I intend to continue my fight till the end. And if I live long enough, I intend to challenge all those laws once again and have the judgments overturned. I am living under that hope. He has told you that I have been moving around in universities and law schools. I have been talking about law. I have been talking about constitution. I have been talking about constitutional issues and the constitutional deviations. That is the lifelong struggle. And it was very, very, I was very comfortable with that subject. It was easy for me. It was that I had gone through. I said at some at certain places that there is a Persian couplet which says, Tanhama daak daak shud, pamba kuja kuja neham. My whole body is bruised with wounds. Where shall I put the bomb? So I am not here to uncover those wounds that I have suffered during all these years. In law schools, I have touched on the core constitutional issues, and I have referred to the American jurists. I have referred to James Madison. I have referred to 
uh, Samuel Chase, the United States Chief Justice, Judge, and, and I have also referred the judges of the Indian Supreme Court and Pakistan Supreme Court. That was all legal, pure legal. But this evening is different. This evening you have given me a subject, and in the subject and the issue that Amjad has touched upon, you have packed so much in that title which I am supposed to address that I feel that I am expected to perform a miracle of condensation, if I may, because that is not a talk for one hour. It is not even a talk for one day. It is a talk for the whole life. But nevertheless, I am not daunted by the challenge, and I am going to try whatever I can. <laughs> now, he said, we need to know whether ISIS is Islam or whether ISIS is really caliphate. Is that really based in Quran and Sunnah? Before I touch that question, let me first, to open my observations, remark and say that I, is, I say most unreservedly, unequivocally, and uh, categorically I say ISS is neither Islam nor Caliphate. I have, I have no doubt about it. And I am saying that on what I have studied from Quran and Sunnah all my life. But I'll talk about that later. Now, why is it, and he has referred to one of the journalists of the United States who said the ISS is a spiritual movement. I have my doubts about that. With all respect for the, for the journalist who wrote that, he may have a special angle, a particular angle from which he said that, but I most respectfully disagree with him. ISS is not a spiritual movement. ISS is only, he might say, if I might say, is debasing the spiritual uh, symbols, is debasing the spiritual symbols and the spiritual narrative that we hear mostly. Now, before I come to that, why he is doing that, how he is doing that, I am reminded of, a, of an English philosopher, Aldous Huxley. I am not going to quote from him. It's a very lengthy article and a very lengthy essay and a very interesting essay. I hope many of you have read that essay. The essay is Words and Behavior. I am referring to that because human conduct is directly influenced by behavior. Freedom of expression, freedom of speech is vital. Why is it vital? Because what I am, what I think in my mind, what I feel, can only get expression through the words that I speak. Words are the vehicle of communication. Without words, I will not be able to communicate. I will die a dumb man with all my ideas in my head if I did not have the freedom to speak. Freedom of speak, speech. Therefore, freedom of speech is very important. And uh, I am reminded again of uh, a Nobel laureate from Bangladesh, from Bengal, the great poet and a musician, Rabindranath Tagore. He said, I love God because he has given me freedom to deny him. Just now, you heard a Quranic verse being recited. If God had so intended, if God had so willed, he would have snatched the will from us to deny him. But he has given us that freedom. And we, many of us, deny his very existence. We, we have no faith in God. We are atheists or we are agnostics or whatever. But I am free to deny that there is a God. And that freedom is given by God. And that freedom is very precious. And that is why we talk so much about freedom of expression. But that freedom of expression is used and abused, both. Huxley is talking about the, 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 the function of that speech. And he says, let me read a sentence from him. He said, he said, let me, uh, he said, uh, uh, he said, words form the thread on which we string our experience. We will live a very spasmodic life, disconnected life, disjointed life, if the words were not there to connect our thoughts. And he has also given examples. In the animal life, love and hatred are at the mercy of small distractions. You see two cats fighting very fiercely, and the next moment they, they are gone and they are again friends. They forget this is an enemy. But in human life, because we use words, our memory and our experience is connected with those words. The word enemy 
keeps me reminded that it is proper for me to be angry and to be on the defensive because he is an enemy. The word enemy sets the whole chain of motions in my mind. The word mother, symbol of affection, symbol of love. Somebody says, she's a, he's a, she's a mother. I'm all respect. I'm all full of love and affection. That mother evokes all those sentiments in me. So the, what these politicians and the, uh, and the fascist rulers and the dictators, they abuse the word. So what is actually happening is that this faculty of speech, which is so precious, and which God has de de described in Quran as a great bounty and a great favor, we are using that uh, freedom of speech not to express what we want to say, but to suppress what we want to say. Now, these are the dual functions. We express what we want to say through words, and through words we conceal also. We use words which will carry different meanings. We carry words which will create different impressions, which with different sentiments. So when we say enemy, my feelings of anger and hatred are evoked. And what the, these people, fascist leaders and dictators, they do is they personify abstractions with individuals. Enemy, foreigner, communist, capitalist, heretic, they, in different words they're used. And all the odium, all the hatred is packed into one word, enemy foreigner, alien, all those, first we give the, uh, put all the wrong meaning into it, we all put all the hatred into it, then all that we have to do is tag that word to an individual. When I say enemy, everything that I know about the enemy is now for that man. Same about, uh, about the political language. In the political language, communists and in, in Islamic terminology, now I'm, that is what I'm trying to explain. That in the world of Islam, in the world of religion, Christianity, Buddhism, or whatever, there are certain words which carry meanings. And those words have been understood in the light of the scriptures for a very long time. And on th with those words, our sentiments are attached. So if we can manage to abuse those words, we can manage to create uh, trouble. For instance, in this ISIS case and in many other cases, and that is the subject of my study, I hope I am able to cover something like that and I am able to communicate what I am trying to say. There are two words in the Islamic terminology. One is jihad and the other is khilafat. Now jihad and khilafat, they, their meaning have been distorted. The perverted and distorted notion of jihad and khilafat has been source of trouble throughout the Islamic history right from the very early period, leaving aside the first 30 or 40 or 50 years of Islamic period. The, in the rest of the period, the word jihad and word khilafa were, were abused and a distorted notion prevailed. And that distorted notion also uh, uh, continues in the Western thought, in the Western writing. I, I'll show you some of those writings to show you why is it that ISS wants to stick on to the word khilafa why is it that they want to stick on to jihad? What they are doing is neither khilafa nor jihad nor Islam. The very antithesis of Islam. If an Islamic person or a person having love for Islam or having an access to the source material of Islam will not buy that idea. But these people who, I mean, these terrorist organizations and those people who have their own axe to grind, they exploit those words, and with those words, the sentiment attached with those words are also exploited. How, how it is done, I'll presently show that. But let me uh, uh, read one or two things which I want to read for you. And before I do that, let me also say and summarize what I have said so far, and uh, which is going to be the basis of my talk. The, can, the concept of making khilafa and state a necessary integral part led to the belief that monarchy was also khilafa. What happened in the early period? Now khilafa, the word khilafa is succession, means succession. Khalifa means a successor. The, the Prophet Muhammad, now let me read that from Hitti first to, to bring you to the crux of the matter. Philip K. Hitti, a historian, he says, now this is where the trouble starts. As long as Muhammad lived, he performed the functions of prophet, 
law giver, religious leader, chief judge, commander of the army, and head of the state all in one. But now that Muhammad was dead, who was to be his successor, his Khalifa? Now successor, Khalifa. Who was to, his, to be his Khalifa? In all except the spiritual function. Now this is it is view, I do not subscribe to that. But he said, who was to succeed, succeed Muhammad in all except the spiritual function? In his role as the last greatest prophet who had delivered the final dispensation to mankind, Muhammad evidently could have no one to succeed him. So the, what he is saying is that Muhammad was everything. He was the head of the state, but he was also a prophet. So when he died, the prophet would die with him because there was to be no prophet after, after him. That is a common belief among the, Muhammad, uh, among the Muslims. Muhammad is the last prophet, the final and the last prophet. Quran is the final law. So after Muhammad, his spiritual succession, according to Hitti, stopped. And the people who succeeded him, Abu Bakr and Omar and Usman and Ali, they succeeded his state. They succeeded his political authority. That is a concept which is being given here, which I do not totally agree, but that is a fact of how it was conceived. Then, uh, unfortunately, the Western, Western historians have given currency to that idea. And uh, Bernard Louis, our present-day writer, an American writer, the, the title Khalifa attaches clearly, uh, Khalifa Allah clearly makes a claim. Now, this is, these are the concepts which are being utilized and which are being exploited. So he says, ma makes a claim to, the something, to something like a divine right of monarchy. Khilafah is a divine right of monarchy. I do not agree with that. I'll, I'll tell you why not. A divine right of monarchy an authority deriving directly from God, but after, but far the more usual interpretation that the totality of Sunni ulama was that the caliph was the deputy, deputy or successor of the prophet, that is to say, the custodian of moral and material heritage of the prophet, custodian of the moral and material heritage. Moral heritage is the law of Islam, material heritage is the state of Medina city-state of Medina, moral heritage of the Prophet, in his double capacity as founder of the faith and, and the creator of the Islamic polity and community, but not in his spiritual office as Prophet, as long uh, as the bringer and interpreter of God's word. In principle, there could be only one Khalifa, one supreme sovereign. This was perceived as a universal. In a different perspective, might, we might say, an imperial title, an Islamic equivalent of the Hellenistic, Hellenic uh, universal empire, uh, idea of pan bacillus, that is all king presiding over other kings. Universal empire, indeed, right through the Middle Ages, now here, this is where the trouble starts. Right through the Middle Ages, the title Khalifa was used by those who held or at least claimed the office of supreme Muslim ruler and never by a lesser sovereign. Now, this is the concept of Khilafah which is going on. So, what happened was that uh, what I am trying to argue this, this evening is, and for which, of course, we can talk for hours and hours, that is the Khilafah in the real sense, in the, in the sense that the Quran has given us, Khilafah is not a succession of the state of Medina. Khilafah is a spiritual succession. Because ISIS talks of Khilafat and Islamic State. My view is that the, Islam, the conflation of state and religion is unknown to Islam. These are two different things. Religion is not state. State is not religion. They overlap somewhere, but they are not the same thing. So conflation of state and religion, I argue, is not the Islamic concept. But these people who want to... Why? Because that world which is respected by the Muslim throughout the world. We look to the history and, uh, 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 and, and we take pride in that period and all our love and attach to that period. And therefore, if a usurper, just as in our Pakistan and in many countries, when a dictator usurps the, uh, usurps the state and the constitution, 
he comes and takes over and then says, I am the president of Pakistan. Instead of saying dictator, I am the president of Pakistan. This is a democratic, this is a basic democracy, different kind of a democracy. But nevertheless, they stick to the word democracy because the people like the word democracy. So these people, after Ali and after Muhaviya, the uh, Umayyad dynasty and the Abbasi, di Abbasi dynasty and the Umayyad dynasty and all those kings, monarchs of the Muslim world who held a great empire, they all adopted the, they donned the title of Khalifa because it was sacred, because their rule was illeg illegitimate, because they were not the successor of the Prophet, because they were the usurpers of the authority which they wanted to use over the people. So therefore, they adopted that sacred word so what I, the, the, the idea of uh, uh, Huxley, words and behavior, because we know, all we know that our behaviors are regulated by the words, so therefore we want to catch upon the words and mislead the people. I, I am a usurper, and this has happened in Pakistan many a time. It is happening in Islam for a very long time. I could uh, give you countless examples. There was one time when the King of Saudi Arabia wanted to be the Khalif al Muslimin. He was not accepted as the Khalif al Muslimin. There was a talk of pan Islamic state by Jamal al Afghani, which was not accepted. There, there was a time when the Egyptian king wanted to be the, uh, the, the Khalif al Muslimin. So, so the, anyhow, because now there are so many nation states, and the concept of Khilafah was not a nation state, but a pan Islamic state. So that, 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 that I'm going to say, that, that idea is. Continuing in the modern day, the uh, Madeleine Albright, how she looks at it. It should be an advantage that though no government on earth, that is, we're talking of present time, openly embraces Al Qaeda. Nobody embraces Al Qaeda, no government. One reason is that Al Qaeda would like to replace the current system of national states. Al-Qaeda would like to replace the present system of national states with a single religious government, a caliphate that would command the loyalty of all Muslims. What is Al-Qaeda doing? Al-Qaeda is a terrorist organization. Al-Qaeda also says, we are going to create that Islamic caliphate. Caliphate, caliphate, the word caliphate. Instead of talking disorder, instead of talking of terrorism, they talk of caliphate. So the Muslim youth or the Muslim mind who are attached to that world, they, they start converging towards these people. That is what is ISI also happening. So much so that our own Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto, she wrote a book, Reconciliation. Pakistan, under a military dictatorship, had become the epicenter of an international terrorist movement that had two primary aims. First, the extremists aim to reconstitute the concept of caliphate, a political state, encompassing the great Ummah, entire population, Muslim population of the world. So she also realized that, that this is what they are trying to do. So what I am saying is not, uh, not only the, uh, uh, the idea of my own thought, the thought is shared by many. So these words are wrongly used by these people, and that is what this uh, ISS is doing, and ISIS is bent upon. The other word which is being used is jihad, the distorted notion of jihad. That If I enter into that subject, it's a very long subject again. But now it has been universally acknowledged that jihad is not this uh, terrorism and mischief mongering. Jihad is something very sacred. So then I, I would conclude this part by saying that, that the caliphate is a spiritual succession of the prophet and a medium by which the medium for the continuous tri transmission of the prophetic blessing. The mission of the Prophet is stated in the Quranic verses. Imam Jafar Sadiq, the great Shia Imam, believed in the separation of Khilafat and the state and believed that to establish government is the, maybe a part of the Imam's duty but not his primary duty. To say that Khalifa should necessarily form a state the various periods of Khilafat were... Now, why I say that this is not Khilafat? Because in the light of Quran and Sunnah, we talk about Islamic State. There is no such thing as Islamic State. From, this, for the, from my study, I say, there is no specific form of Islamic State 
given either by Quran or by the prophetic Sunnah. All that Islam has done, Islam has sponsored certain values, social values, economic values. There shall be no interest. Social values, political values. So all those values adopted in any form, anywhere in the world, will be an Islamic state, if you want to call it. But it's not an Islamic state. The values were adopted, sponsored by Islam. So there is no Islamic state uh, as such. So therefore, to say that caliphate is state is not correct. But if you see the, uh, why I'm saying this is because if you see the Quran, I say that uh, caliphate is a spiritual succession, not the succession of the state of Medina. People would say, well, the word Khalifa has been used in Quran. So I will not be able to quote all these verses and chapters, though if I, I was so minded, I could do that. But then it will be a theology class. I'm not going to do that. I'm not holding a class on theology. But I might give you, and you can go and check it up. And if you want to come to me, I'll show you all that. But at this time, I want to uh, compress my. In Quran, there is a different set of verses in the Quran, which deal with the concept of caliphate as a spiritual succession. Chapter Noor, chapter Juma, chapter Waqiya, and certain other chapter, we have verses where the concept of spiritual succession is mentioned. There are other verses of the Quran where the statecraft, the values of the, as I, as I mentioned, the values of the statecraft are mentioned. Most of them are in Surah al Imran and Surah Al Nisa. These are two, chapter four and five, perhaps. So they are the numbers. So I have named the chapters. So what I'm saying is that the statecraft has been provided in a different set of Quranic verses. And spiritual section, which is succession, which is Khilafah, has been provided another different section. Of, therefore, Khilafah and state are not the same thing. That is the basis of my argument, that Khilafah and state are not the same thing. And there is no conflation of state and religion in Islam. Now, he wants, the, the ISIS wants Islamic state. They say, Islamic state of Iraq and Syria. What Islamic state? This is not even... This is the greatest joke of the century to say that it is Islamic State. All the Islamic values are thrown to the winds. The, the way the minorities are being treated, the way the people are being killed, that is not. And I'll show you what the Islamic State was. If there ever was a state based on the Islamic principle and which was to be followed in the precept of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, it was, it was the city-state of Medina. Prophet established a state. We have seen that historians have said that he was a ruler and all that. Now, in that state, he promulgated what I might call the constitution of the city-state of Medina. It is commonly known as the Medina Charter. The British Encyclopedia calls it the constitution of the Medina state. It has 47 articles. I am surprised as a lawyer when I see that document. The language is so much like the present day legal language. If I were to draft a constitution today, or if any American lawyer were to draft a constitution today, he would perhaps do in the same pattern. The Pakistani constitution, Indian constitution. So the, the document is drafted in there. It has 47 articles. I will not read all the 47 articles, but in order to show what kind of a state it was, I will read parts of it. I will, I, I will not read the Arabic text because many of you will get bored. This is, this is a prescript of Muhammad, the prophet and the messenger of God, to operate among, now these are the high contracting parties, to operate among the faithful believers and the submitters to the will of God from among the Quraysh who had migrated from Makkah, from among the Quraysh and the people of Yasrab. So high contracting parties are the believers who have migrated from Makkah and the people of Yasrab, which is the old name of Medina. The people of Medina, these are the high contracting parties. Other parties are also coming. But these high contracting parties are constituting a constitution. I know, yes, sir. 
the city of Medina had at that time 12 pagan tribes. And attached to those 12 pagan tribes, there were 12 Jewish tribes who were the clients of the pagan tribes. So all those tribes became a party. And the rights of each of the tribes were safeguarded in this constitution, in this word. So then he said, listen to the next word. Verily, they constitute a political ummah as distinct from the rest of the world. Wahum ummatum mindun in nas. They are one people, they are one political unit. The word ummah is usually used by Muslims for the Muslim community. But here the word is used in a political sense. The, the Quraysh of Bakka, the, the helpers of Medina, the tribe, pagan tribes of Medina, all these people, whom Ummatum Mindun in Nas, they are one nation, one, one pe people, one political unit as against the rest of the world. So this is a stage. And then it goes on to say, verily, the immigrants of the Quraysh shall be responsible for their ward. Then Article 3, the Banu Auf shall be responsible for, the, these are long articles, I'm only enumerating. Banu Auf shall be responsible for their ward and they will pay their blood money. Banu Saida will pay the, responsible for their all. They will pay their, pay their blood money according to their old custom. So all their old customs are retained and the Jews of the Medina will follow their own customs about the uh, payment of blood money and about the... So the, the tribes are Banu Jusham, Banu Najjar, Banu Amir, Banu, uh, Banu Nabit, and then after that the sub-tribes, the clans, they have also been mentioned by name by name and their rights have been enumerated. Then article, I think it is article 20, and then after the, the, these rights, the, the Article 16 says, and verily the Jews who follow us will help and equality, neither shall be they be oppressed nor, nor they shall be helped against them. And Article 17, verily the peace of, peace of the believer shall be one. If one of that makes peace, the others will. And verily, the detachment, etc., 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 then I go on to the Jewish tribes are mentioned. After that, Article 25. Here, and verily, the Jews of Banu Avar will shall be. In a, a, a verily, the Jews of Bani Of shall be considered as a community along with the believers. There, the first clause said, they shall be a, they shall be an ummah, a political entity, as against the rest of the world. Now the Jews have been joined in. The Jews will be a community, a, a political entity, along with the Muslims, with equal rights. So, what is this ISIS talking about killing Jews and Jerusalem and all that? Prophet made a pact with them, Prophet gave them a constitution, and I'll show you what guarantees the Prophet had given to these people and the Christian. Who can uh, talk of uh, ISS, or Islamic State, doing all these things? The founder of the concept of it, in order to give a model how the, the Islamic values should be adopted in a state, this is the first found, state founded by the Prophet himself. So in this, the, I have read some of the articles. So in this uh, document, there are 47 articles. I do not intend to read all of them. And then the article 40. And verily the valley of Yasrab shall constitute an inviolable, constitute an inviolable territory. So this is the metropolis, the inviolable territory for, uh, and it shall be defended. And then again, ultimately, It says, and verily, God, God is the protector of those who fulfill the, and observe the pledges scrupulously, even as Muhammad, messenger of God, uh, may incline to and protect him as uh, the prophet. Now, this is what this state said. 
I, I, I could give you a long comment on how the political right, first of all, these are small units. The tribes will be responsible for their word. The word used in the Arabic is the Wahum Allah Rib'atehim, which means two men. They will be responsible for the area in which they live, and they will be responsible and follow their own custom. So internal autonomy to each tribe, internal autonomy to each tribe. Then joint defense, joint war. Nobody, all these things are provided. Then joint social security is also mentioned in this. If there is a person who is under a burden, that community will provide a social security for that man. Nobody shall die under a debt. This is the provision in this. So social security. So all these things are provided. And this is the kind of, uh, if at all, an Islamic state is to be, it is to be like this. And only, not only this. This was not only, some, some people say, amongst the, amongst the Muslim scholars also, I think Maulana Madhudi it was, who said it was simply a pact. And the pact uh, very soon it uh, expired. It is no longer a precedent binding for us. So those who want to violate the pact, they want to create an impression that the pact is no longer valid. But I will show you the prophet had said this will be valid for all time. And I have, uh, there are books of history which enumerate the, that, that the fourth Khalifa, even at that time, he had this document written down and wrapped around as the sheath of his fold as a proof of the, the, the pact that was, the, the, which was still valid. And then, the, how did the Prophet fulfill this? I will read to you a document. I am giving up many of the articles which I wanted to discuss. At one time, the Prophet gave an amnesty, a charter, to the Christians of St. Catherine. That St. Catherine is even present today, I understand. That church of St. Catherine is still present. The people, Christian people of that time, the, Pope, the Prophet gave them an amnesty. Hear that. Listen to this, what it says. And this is quoted by great historian Al-Balazari, not the follower of Muhammad. He was a Christian, perhaps. This is the document which Muhammad, I am going to read the whole of it, so please bear with me for a while. You would like to hear it. This document which Muhammad, son of Abdullah, God's prophet, warner and bearer of glad tidings, has caused to be written so that there should remain no excuse who, for those who come after him. So he's writing it for the posterity also. So that there shall remain no excuse for those who come coming after him. I have caused this document to be written for Christians of the East and the West, for those who live near and for those who live at distant land, for the Christians living at present and for those all, all who come after. Again, Christians in the posterity, Christians of future, Christians of Syria, Christians of Iraq, Christians anywhere in the world. The prophet of God has guaranteed, given a guarantee, and I will read in the end what is the kind of that guarantee. The Christians living at present and for all those who live after, for those Christians who are known to us and all those who are not known to us. Any Muslim violating and abusing what is here in order would be regarded as a violator of God's testament. I say this violator of God's testament, that is what I say. Violator of God's testament and would be the breaker of his promise and would make himself deserving of God's curse. This is the word of the prophet. Lest somebody should say the Mujibur Rahman came here and started abusing people. I am not abusing anybody. I promise, listen again, I promise here the churches are being burned in Pakistan and the, and the, uh, the, the, the statutes of Buddha are being destroyed in Afghanistan and all these things are being done. See what the Prophet said. I, profit, uh, I promise that any monk or wayfarer who will seek my help on the mountains and forests, deserts or habitation or in places of worship, I will repel his enemies with all my friends and helpers. 
with all my relatives, with all those who profess to follow me and will defend him because they are my own covenant. And I will defend the covenant against the persecution, injury, and embarrassment by their enemy in lieu of the poll tax which I have promised to pay. If they prefer themselves to defend their properties and persons, they will be allowed to do so and will not be put to any inconvenience on that account. No bishop shall be expelled from his bishopric. No man monk from his monastery. No priest from his place of worship. And no pilgrim will be detained in his pilgrimage. None of their children, none of their churches and other places of worship will be desolated or destroyed or demolished. Prophets, prophets promise. Covenant, this is being violated. How, how can they call it an Islamic state? What Islamic state? None of their churches and places of worship will be desolated or destroyed or demolished. No material of their churches will be used for building mosques or houses of Muslims. Any Muslim so doing will be regarded a recalcitrant of God and his prophet. Monks and bishops will be subject to no tax. This is also the law, universal law. The religious ministers are not required to pay tax. Religious ministers are not required to conscript or to serve, serve a war. Subject to tax or indemnity, whether they live in forests or the rivers or in the east or west, north or south. I give them my word of honor. They are on my promise and covenant. It will enjoy perfect immunity from all sorts of inconvenience. Every hell shall be given them in the repair of their churches. This has been done in good old days in the Muslim period. Churches were repaired by their state expense. They shall be absolved from wearing arms. They shall be protected by Muslims. Let this document not let this document be not disobeyed till the judgment of till the judgment day. Now this is the amnesty which Prophet granted to the Christians of Saint Catherine. Those who violate this, how can they claim to be either a Muslim state or a caliphate or whatever? I have briefly submitted what I had to say. But I was saying, uh, I had said to you, uh, stated earlier, that the caliphate is a spiritual succession. And the prophet visualized, and prophet, it was not prophet's own vision. It is our belief. It is the belief of every Muslim that the prophet's vision was the God-given divine vision. He saw the things. And he had clearly foretold the course that the caliphate would follow through the history. So therefore, when I say that the state and caliphate are not the same thing, I am referring not only to a verse of Quran, but the explanation of that verse in the tradition of the holy prophet. And that is a verse, uh, a translation of a, uh, of a hadith, a prophetic tradition, uh, re uh, reported in a famous book of Hadith, Musnad Ahmad bin Hanbal. Those of you who do not know, it is one of the compilations of Hadith. Huzaifa bin al Yaman narrates that the Holy Prophet said, now this is how the things were recorded in the Muslim history. The sayings of the Prophet are recorded. I heard from my father, my father heard from his father, and the, he heard from the Prophet. The chain of narration is always given. So here is in the last, here is the narrator who has himself heard it from the Prophet. Huzaifa bin al Yaman narrates that the Holy Prophet said. So he is the first in the chain of narration. He has heard it himself. So he is reproducing them. He said, Prophethood shall remain with you for as, as long as Allah wills. That is, I will, I will, be, I will live as long as Allah lives, uh, wills. He will then cause it to, be, to, uh, to end. Then the prophet will die. That, that is what it means. He will then cause it to end. The Khilafat will be established on the precepts of the prophethood immediately after him, which will last for as long as Allah wills. He will cause, then he will cause it to end. Oppressor kingship, oppressive kingship will then follow and its rules will last as long as Allah wills. He will then cause it to end. After this, tyrannical monarchies will follow, and their, their, their rule will last for as long as Allah wills. 
Allah will then cause it to end. Khilafat will then be established on the precept of prophethood. So this is the course that the Khilafa has to follow. So the monarchs and the kings and the, of Banu Umayyah and the sultans of Turkey and the sultan of Spain and the kings of India and all those, all those are covered period. And that is the period when the Khilafa is for the time being absent. And then God will cause Khilafat to be, to be on the uh, precept of prophet which is the something which all Muslims believe and they are waiting for this. I will not go into the theological debate. But this is not what it is. That Khilafah which has to be on the precept of prophethood. So th that is spiritual. So I am saying that this Khilafah is a spiritual succession. Anybody, any military dictator, any, any ambitious uh, person who wants to, uh, who, who is moving with a, mission to conquer the entire world for Islam on a distorted notion of jihad is not a khalifa, is not an Islamic state. And I think I will stop there and I will uh, have questions for as long as you like. Um, so you mentioned, or I guess you mentioned a little bit more um, that you think that the Islamic community has to do something to combat this type of um, extremism. What can we as non-Muslims do um, to get ourselves kind of active in the conversation, other than being here tonight, um, but also being a combat for that type of extremism? Just repeat the question. I, I think the question is, what can uh, those who aren't Muslim do to fight this, uh, to fight ISIS or fight this extremism, to join the fight, if you will, of Muslims? You see, whether it's Muslims or not, the, my, my, my idea is, when I'm talking to you, and uh, most of you are not Muslim, and, you, uh, and I know that, my idea being here and addressing you, the youth, as I said, the youth are our future hope. If you want to fight it, they say if a, if a doctor has to prescribe a medicine, he has to diagnose the disease. I'm only trying to help you diagnose what, the, what is, where is the wrong. Once I have diagnosed that, then perhaps you will find out 101 ways of meeting with it. The one thing is that you will not be silenced by somebody say, don't talk to me, it is Quran and so Because I'm a Muslim, you don't know what is Quran. I know what is Quran, so don't talk to me. I'm a Muslim, I believe it's Khilafat. So you can turn back and say, no, this is not what Islam is. That is the Obama, Obama said. President Obama said, this is not Islam. So the purpose is to educate and to inform, to, to provide you uh, 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 help for diagnosis. If I may just add, um, I think that the responsibility of non-Muslims in this current existential threat of ISIS is paramount. Without non-Muslims actually understanding the spiritual firmament that that guides a group like ISIS without them understanding the perversions that exist in Islam, without understanding what the Prophet stood for, what he fought for, what he believed in, without understanding what the Charter of Medina is, the first constitution of the nation state, without understanding how the Prophet protected Christians and Jews and other minorities, including those who are the current Yazidis or Zoroastrians in his time, without understanding what it is that is so beautiful about this man, that so many over a billion people love and cherish, without understanding that, you won't be equipped to counter the inflammatory rhetoric that comes from people like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. So the more non-Muslims can understand and become equipped with the true history of Islam, with the examples of the Prophet, with what he said, and with those Muslims who are fighting that fight, literally risking their lives for that fight, the, the more isolated ISIS will become, the more endangered ISIS will become, because their militant perversion will be on the ropes, and they will have to justify their nefarious acts of beheading journalists or of forcing Christian women into marriage or forcing people to have to pay a tax, 
or not respecting borders, or not lining up with proper armies, or violating the laws of war, they'll have to explain that. And that ideology will become marginalized and minuscule. And to be fair, the Muslims of the world have actually come together, many leaders, and have condemned this scourge. But the question is, what do we, as American Muslims, what can we do to tell people like ISIS that, and I always argue this, that the Constitution of the United States is more Islamic than the Constitution of many Islamic countries? You see, you know uh, the, uh, you see the, 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 the way I started my talk, the words and behavior, mm -hmm. you have to understand how the sacred words are being abused. So once you understand how the sacred words are being abused, then you will not call it a spiritual movement. You will call it another Al-Qaeda. You will call it a tyranny. You will not call it a spiritual movement. So you have to understand that the word, the sacred words are being abused. So those sacred words have to be understood. That is what I have tried to explain in the short talk that I have given. Yes, there was a question. Yeah. First, allow me to tender my greetings of peace to you and to the crowd. Uh, I have this question. Uh, in which historical documents can we find copies of the Mecca, the Medina Manifesto? The, the Charter of Medina? Uh, yeah. Yes. The Charter of Medina you will find in the famous book of history known as Sirat Ibn Hisham. Ibn Hisham is the well known book. Ibn Hisham has been translated into English. It has been translated into French. Sirat Ibn Hisham is the where you will find the treaty uh, in, in all its various articles. I have to taken this. I have with me the Arabic text as the Arabic text is from Ibn Hisham. Translation is mine. So the Arabic text you will find in Sirat Ibn Hisham. And its English translation of Ibn Hisham is also available. I forget the name of the author. It is somebody. And the charter and the, that the uh, amnesty of the St. Catherine, you will find in another book of history which is known as Al-Balazari. The name of the book is Futuhul Buldan by Al-Balazari. Balazari has been also translated in English, I understand. If not, I am not very sure. But Balazari is available in Arabic. The name of the book is Futuhul Buldan, The con Conquest of the Countries. In that, the Futuhul Buldan is the name of the book. Al Balazari is the author. Okay, I think you have uh, you have uh, been taxed quite a bit. You are not used to sitting that long talking to uh, listening to a talk ad infinitum. I have tried to compress as much as I could. Thank you.